Have you ever been scared to use an epinephrine auto injector like an EpiPen or an AviQ? Chances are you have, and guess what? You are not alone. I'm so excited about this episode of our podcast where my good friend Pam Lestage is back on the podcast asking me questions about epinephrine, specifically the nine misconceptions about epinephrine auto injectors. Can you guess what our number one question is? Keep listening to find out. Welcome to Food Allergy and Your Kiddo with Dr. Alice Hoyt, the podcast about demystifying food allergies, diminishing allergy anxiety, and taking back control. Let's navigate this challenge together with evidence-based information, scientific research, and tried and proven practices. And now, here's your host, board-certified allergist and immunologist specializing in food allergy, Dr. Alice Hoyt. Hey, Pam. I'm so excited about our episode um, today where we are going to talk about some of those myths, factor fiction, things that I've been asked very regularly, questions that I think you've been asked by yeah. other parents, yep. questions you've had. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of these questions are questions that I think a first-time parent that is given an EpiPen prescription Thinks. And some of these questions, too, are, are kind of questions that pop up later on that you never really thought you would think about um, mm -hmm. until it happens. Mm -hmm. So um, I think these are great questions for um, anybody that's new to allergies or anybody that has been living in, in allergy land for a while. Yes, because sometimes things change, especially right. with new devices. You know, if you are a parent of a kiddo who's now going to college and has right. had a diagnosis of food allergy since they were one year old, then recommendations have changed since then. So oh, absolutely. yeah, I'm super excited about going through the top nine misconceptions of epinephrine for food I, allergy reactions. I think it'll be fun. So let's get into it, Miss Pam. Let's go nine to one for these questions. So number nine. Number nine. Does the generic EpiPen device work the same as a regular EpiPen? And it's a good one because back when there was sort of a shortage of EpiPens, when they kind of all got recalled, um, we had to get a generic EpiPen and it does not look the same. So I think, and I had a lot of questions, so I think this is great. Yes, this is a very good question because short answer, no, the actual devices can be very, very different. Now, does each epinephrine auto injector, that, that's the, the name of these types of EpiPen, AviQ, AdrenaClick, Twinject, those are called epinephrine auto injectors. And even when pe people say a generic EpiPen, now there is a generic version of Myelin's EpiPen. Right. But typically when people are referring to a generic EpiPen, they're actually referring to the AdrenaClick or Impax version of these. And if in while y'all are listening to this podcast, if you're like, oh my gosh, I had no idea there were so many epinephrine auto injectors, <laughs> don't sweat it. In the show notes, we're going to put a link to the blog that's going to highlight sort of the different types of epinephrine auto injectors. But ultimately, why this is such an awesome question is because it's so important that parents, babysitters, teachers know how to use the device that the kiddo is prescribed. Again. And Pam, I think you had a couple questions about this. Yes. Okay. So when we got it, you know, the the regular EpiPen that you think of whenever the Myelin EpiPen that you think of whenever you first get your prescription and you go to the pharmacy and that's what they give you. Um, this one was not the same at all. It opened um, differently. And then when you got into it, you know, instead of sort of like this flat sort of tube, it was a cylinder tube and um, it just, it didn't open the same. Um, and I, my concern was, one, was it kid-friendly? Because, you know, I wasn't sure. And two, the fact that not even the school nurse had seen that one. And so that was very concerning to me was, be, and this was when she was a little bit younger, um, probably in first grade when we had to um, do this, was just, 
would this device just work the same? Was it going to output the same if we had to use it? Um, was it going to, it didn't, it didn't have that, that kind of protector like the EpiPen, mm-hmm. Myelin EpiPen mm-hmm. had, um, or the AviQ um, has where it just kind of retracts back in. Mm-hmm. And so I was concerned about that. I was concerned, is this going to cut her if she flinches? Um, and so it was, just, those are kind of my questions. And, and unfortunately, I felt like no one could really answer them um, mm-hmm. unless, you know, they had the device with them or unless they had used it. And, you know, when you go out and you buy your epinephrine devices, you're not just kind of wasting those just to see what it looks like, you know, I mean, right. it costs a pretty penny, um, even the generic ones sometimes. And um, it was just, it just didn't make me feel good. Now, once we got it, I understood it. I watched the videos. Um, I felt more com- confident because at the end of the day, I just want the medicine to work, right? Like it, the device, how it comes out really doesn't matter. I just need them to work. Um, but it's definitely something that when I have to choose one or the other, user friendliness is is my concern at this point, especially with a, a tween. You know, I, I need mm-hmm. to make sure that she's going to be able to use it correctly and not um, hurt herself. Absolutely. I think you're probably referring to a device called um, the AdrenaClick or yes. the Impax epinephrine auto injector. And some of the main reasons that it's so important to know which device you have in that the epinephrine auto injectors do, um, they are a little bit different is because sometimes the needles do not retract or they are not covered. For example, in that, in, in the device, the adrenal click, the impacts, the, um, I see, even I'm trying to use that generic EpiPen, but it's not really (laughs) a generic EpiPen. Um, in, in that device that you're describing, it does have epinephrine in it. It will work the same as – that epinephrine will work the same as epinephrine in an AviQ, epinephrine in an EpiPen, epinephrine in Mylan's generic version of EpiPen. Um, but the needle does not retract after you use it, nor is it covered. Right. That's, different from the EpiPen in which the needle does not retract, but it is covered by a plastic sheath to prevent an accidental needle stick. Of course, we're in an emergency situation. So I certainly recommend when at all possible that, especially for kiddos, they have a device that the needle is going to be covered. In the AviQ, the needle actually retracts. Right. Um, So again, you're not dealing with an exposed needle during an emergency situation. But ultimately, all epinephrine auto injectors contain epinephrine, which is the medication that's going to help stop that allergic reaction. Right. And at the end of the day, that's what we need just to stop it. Yes. Stop it. (laughs) All right. Are you ready for number eight? Bring it. Okay. Is epi only for people with a previous history of anaphylaxis? Now, I I don't know that I've ever thought about this, so I'm interested to hear what you have to say. So this is a really good question because many times I hear from school nurses that parents tell them, well, little Johnny doesn't need an EpiPen for his peanut allergy because little Johnny has only ever had hives. And just because somebody has had only hives for a for one reaction, for an allergic reaction, does not mean that their next reaction will also be just hives. Right. Because usually the second reaction is a little bit stronger, right? Not necessarily. Oh, okay. That is That is also a myth. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) A myth for another time. (laughs) Now, if you have a history of a severe allergic reaction, you are at higher risk to again have a severe allergic reaction. Okay. So if you have a severe severe one before, you're more likely that the next one will also be severe. Right. If you have a mild reaction before, doesn't matter. You can still have a severe reaction. Right. Um, that certainly warrants epinephrine. So no, epi is not only for people with a history of anaphylaxis or a severe allergic reaction. Epinephrine should be prescribed to every child who has uh, an IgE, as we talked about in other podcasts, right. or 
um, an anaphylactic put, or potentially anaphylactic, we can call it that if we want to, um, food allergy. Right. And there's another question, number one, that's going to be really good um, kind of follow up to this question, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, because, you know, like you said, let the suspense build. Yes. Dun, dun, dun. Well, because, you know, I think that, you know, unfortunately, sometimes people just think, oh, no big deal. She'll throw it up or she'll just get itchy. Um, So we have the EpiPen, but, you know, we don't really use it. Or maybe they don't have an EpiPen, again, because maybe they just don't know, you know, oh, it's only been highs before. And they just maybe need a little bit um, more education in in that department um, and maybe a, a bigger conversation with their allergist. Absolutely. And that, again, is why it's so important to have a discussion with your allergist, to see your allergist every year. The days of, oh, three-year-old little Rebecca has a peanut allergy. Um, Here's an EpiPen. Peace out. Right. That's not how food allergy is being practiced. Right. Um, we, I, as an allergist, like to see my patients at least every year right. to discuss what reactions they've had in the, um, over the year, if any, hopefully not. Right. Um, if they've had any accidental ingestions of their allergen and tolerated the allergen, which right. could be amazing, right? Um, I like to refill their epinephrine auto injector my, myself. I like to make sure that they know how to use their device that they're being prescribed. And, you know, sometimes I don't know what insurance companies are going to do. Actually, a lot of times I don't know what insurance companies are going to do. <laughs> no um, one does. So I tell them, I say, look, if if you end up getting an epinephrine auto injector that is different than the ones we've gone over today, because I'll typically, I or my nurses um, will show them how to use the devices. So Absolutely. important. Absolutely. Yes. Um, then I say, you know, let me know, ask the pharmacist right there how to use it, but let me know too. And you're welcome to come back and we were, we will show you. I definitely want you to know how to use the device. Um, and I'll plug code Anna right now. Um, the nonprofit that you and I both work with, um, that, you know, we have a video on the website of how to use, how and when to use epinephrine auto injectors. Right. And right. We also have a course people can take that helps support the organization that helps equip schools for medical emergencies like anaphylaxis, but not but, just schools, also grandparents, caregivers. I mean, anybody can take that course. My in-laws took that course and, and we made sure that we taught them well, but they felt like, okay, well, here's a doctor, you know, showing us how to do this with actual video, with actual devices, um, mm-hmm. and, and kind of in a, in a, situation where it seemed very real. And so I think sometimes that's better for people to see because it it really makes it real. And it really kind of puts you in that mind space of of what it will look like whenever you do have to use it, if you have to use it. Yes. Yes. Okay. So kind of a little bit of a follow-up to whether you need this for a history of anaphylaxis is, is it only needed for a serious reaction? That is an awesome question because short answer, no. The reason that it's not just needed for a serious reaction is because the way anaphylaxis often works is that it'll start with one mild symptom and then you want to stop that reaction right. before it progresses, before to all this. Mm -hmm. before all those allergy cells start going crazy, spewing out all these chemicals in your body that are going to cause that trouble breathing, that are going to cause that drop in blood pressure, that is going to cause the increase in heart rate that is needed to help the person survive that reaction. You want to prevent all of that from happening. So if a child has a nut allergy, they eat something that contains nuts or potentially contains nuts, And then they start having even just some hives on their body. And then, you know, say they're like, you know, I don't really feel right. Or, you know, if they're a younger kiddo, then you have to look for things like they're kind of talking funny and they're kind of scratching. Um, Because a first grader is not going to walk up to you and say, excuse me, mother, I believe I am having (laughs) anaphylaxis. Please administer my epinephrine (laughs) auto injector. No. So you've you've got to be aware of the different symptoms and you want to treat it 
as soon as you recognize it, because we know based on medical evidence that prompt administration of epinephrine from an auto injector saves lives. And I think that's so important too, because, you know, I've heard parents or even other um, people, even a school nurse one time, tell me, oh, they don't need an EpiPen because their allergy isn't serious. Their dairy allergy isn't serious or peanut allergy isn't serious. And I just, sometimes I, I just don't know what to say because lucky for you, you've only had hives, but But maybe that was it. For example, the first time my daughter had a reaction, all she had was hives. And um, thank God that's all she had um, because we didn't have EpiPen at the moment because we didn't know she was going to have a reaction. But that doesn't mean that she doesn't have a serious allergic, uh, a serious allergy. All allergies are serious. Yes, they may manifest in a different way. But if someone prescribes an EpiPen to you, a doctor who has been to medical school and knows all the things, then that's for a reason, right? Like, that's how I think of it. It's just, you know, if someone prescribed you blood pressure medication, you're not just going to say, oh, yeah, maybe I I won't really need it. You know, that's just not the way it is. You take it. And, And the same thing with epinephrine. You have an allergy. It stays with you all the time. I can't stress that enough. You're an awesome allergy mom. (laughs) Thanks. Um, Here's a really good one. Um, Can you give more than one dose? Because epinephrine injectors always come with two. Why Mm -hmm. is that? They do. They come in (laughs) packs of two because you're actually supposed to keep two on you. It's hard enough to keep one on you. I know that. Um, But you're supposed to keep both of them on you in case one fails or in case you need a second dose. When might you need a second dose? You might need a second dose if you you recognize somebody is having anaphylaxis. They have hive swelling. They're having trouble breathing. They're vomiting. You give them their epinephrine auto injector. You know, they start getting a little bit better over a few minutes, but really you're getting up to kind of that five minute mark and you're like, "Mm, they're, they're still not. They're still not looking as good as I would like them to look. Um, They're still, they're still saying like they're having some trouble breathing. You can hear some wheezing. They're still swollen. More hives are developing and help has not arrived yet. Right. Anytime you use epinephrine, you want to call 911. Absolutely. You want 911 to dispatch EMS to come to you. You don't want to drive somebody to the emergency room when they're having anaphylaxis because, God forbid, it worsened, they need another dose, you're driving, or it worsened, you get nervous, you have a car accident, you injure yourself, you're a passenger, you injure somebody else, right? Um, So anytime you use epinephrine, you want to call 911 and not because the medication's dangerous. And we'll get to that, um, I'm sure, with some of these questions, but because the reaction the person is having is dangerous. Right. And um, an allergist told me this one time that when you call 911, you should also let them know that, hey, this person's having an allergic reaction. Can you have epinephrine on you? Again, just because you get two for a reason, what if your second one fails? I mean, God forbid, you know, we pay a lot of money for good devices that we hope that that doesn't happen. But I've always um, told anybody that takes care of my daughter, you know, if she has a reaction, you hit her with epi, you call 911, you tell them to bring up an epinephrine, and then, you know, you watch her for five minutes or so and, and do it again if they're not there. Absolutely. That's exactly right, Pam. The other part of that, of why you always want to tell 911 that they're having an allergic reaction and they, and you can also say anaphylaxis. That's also very hep- helpful. They're having anaphylaxis bring epinephrine is because some rescue squads do not carry epinephrine auto injectors. Right. It depends on very local regulations. So you always want to say 911, my daughter or whomever is having a severe allergic reaction. She's having anaphylaxis. Please send a rig that has epinephrine. Right. Right. 
And we and actually, you can call your local um, fire department or first responders and see if they have that on them because we actually did that. My husband, um, one of his patients was the head or is the head of the departments around here. And, and he did ask them and he did tell us um, which rigs had it and which didn't. Um, so you can even know that ahead of time. And so when you call 911, you can say, hey, can so-and-so come from this department? Because I know they have epinephrine. Clearly, they're going to send, you know, whoever's closest. But, you know, if you're able to do that, um, that would be extremely helpful and something good to know that, again, you don't really think about. That's not really something you think about um, until really it happens. So that's um, that's that's great advice, Pam. Oh, thanks. Um, Here is a a really good one. And I say a really good one. And to me, it's super important because when we were first diagnosed, we were told to do this first. Um, and since then, and with my research, um, I have learned that it is not correct and it is not the right thing to do. And even to this day, I still correct people, including school nurses, including some physicians. And the question is, should I give an antihistamine first and watch and wait for the symptoms to worsen before giving an EpiPen. And I'm going to answer it. And the answer is no, do not Yay, give antihistamine first. Always, always, always give epinephrine first. And I'm going to let you tell us why. <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly right. There were days, because I imagine there are some mamas listening to this or food allergy papas, grandparents, um, teachers. We have a really broad audience. It's super exciting. Yeah, um, absolutely. Listening to this who were thinking, wait, but I, I very much remember being told, give antihistamine and watch and wait. Right. Yes, they were told that in the past. That is not current standard of care. And that, no. again, is why it's so important that that we have cool podcasts like this, right? Or right. that uh, patients see their doctor, their allergist every year. If, if you've never seen an allergist in your kiddo or a, a student in your school or somebody has a food allergy, encourage them to see an allergist. Absolutely. Um, plug for allergists there, right? But yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. The days of watch and wait are gone. The days of recognize, give Epi, and go call 911 are here. The reason we do that is because evidence. So again, this is all about evidence-based medicine, right? right. Evidence tells us, studies tell us that giving epinephrine promptly upon recognition of those allergy symptoms decreases the decreases the risk of death from anaphylaxis. And that's what we want to do. We want to decrease the incidence of death from anaphylaxis. Because once anaphylaxis has started, the cat's out of the bag. We got to right. like shut it down, right? We always want to try to prevent it from ever happening. Right. But once it started, then we're in the mode of we got to shut this down. And you do that with epinephrine. And I think too, sometimes it's because you know, people think, oh, she's just itchy. Oh, he just has hives. But the problem is the symptoms that you can't see. It's the blood pressure drop. It's your heart increasing. It's, you know, the the shortness of breath. Yes, you can kind of see that, but not when it first starts, you know, it first starts and then, it, you know, the child or the adult or whoever is thinking, oh, maybe it's just because I'm nervous. And they don't realize that that's a symptom of anaphylaxis. And so, It's, yes, when you give antihistamine, as I have learned, you get rid of the hives, absolutely, but you don't get rid of that internal, um, I'm sure there's a better medical term for that, but you don't get rid of the stuff happening inside that you can't see. So epi first, always. Antihistamines are just that. They are antihistamine. They do not do the other things that epinephrine does. They do not support a person's blood pressure. They do not support a person's heart rate. The reason in anaphylaxis that your heart rate goes up is because your heart is trying to pump more blood to your head, to your brain, and to your heart to promote survival. And the reason it's going up, one of the reasons is because your own adrenal glands, your own body is secreting epinephrine. And so that epinephrine is supporting what your body is already trying to do. Right. But it does, 
from from what I just said, it does so much more than just that antihistamine. And and not all allergic reactions have hives or have a skin manifestation as that first manifestation. It might be, you know, a kid who ate a cookie who, I mean, you know, has an egg allergy and they thought it didn't have egg in it. And then they're vomiting, vomiting, and they were perfectly well before then. Right. You should give it epinephrine right then um, because you're thinking, oh gosh, he just ate a cookie that probably had egg in it. He has an egg allergy and now he's vomiting profusely when he was previously well. Right. So you give the epinephrine and you you shut down that allergic reaction. Yes. Epi first, always. And call 911. Okay. Here's a good one too, because I do get asked this question a lot. Um, not so much anymore, um, but definitely at the beginning. And I kind of had this question too at the beginning. Can you give epi in the arm or does it always have to be in the leg? Thigh. The best place to administer epinephrine, the best site of injection is in the outer thigh. Studies have show that have shown that epinephrine gets where it needs to go most quickly, most effectively when it's given in the thigh. Can people give it in the arm? Well, you, you can, but should you? No, you should not. It should always be given in the outer thigh. And what is, um, is it because there's What's what's in the outer thigh that makes it the best place? It has to do with blood flow and musculature and really just sort of the anatomy of that area okay. as to why that is the best place. Awesome. I, I never really knew that. I just kind of, I don't know. Epinephrine is best administered from an auto injector intramuscularly into that outer thigh. It is better than giving it even IV. Awesome. Oh, wow. Awesome. Did not know that. See, learn something new every day. So outer thigh is the best location for EpiPen for sure. So then here's the follow-up question. Can you use Epi through a person's clothes? Because what's next to your thigh? Jeans. Absolutely. Yes, you can. The epinephrine auto-injector devices are designed to penetrate clothing without any problem. So you never have to worry about pulling down someone's pants in public. You just use the device how the manufacturer describes, which is typically take the device out of the case, take off the safety cap um, or the safety guard, depending on your device, and then administer the device through the jeans, through whatever clothing they have on into the outer thigh. Awesome. That's a good question because I think that especially in little ones, I remember whenever my daughter was really little um, and she wore skirts to school at the time. So it wasn't that big of a deal. But I do remember her teachers asking me, you know, do I need to pull her pants down? <laughs> and I remember telling them, no, you know, it's it's just, you know, put it firmly against the thigh and it will shoot through. And if it doesn't, that's why you have number two. Okay. This has happened to me. I am... I am embarrassed to say it's happened to me um, not just once, but twice. Um, Can you leave your epi in the car? And I know the answer. (laughs) (laughs) It's it's possible to do it, but you absolutely do not want to do it. You do not want to leave your epinephrine auto injector in any temperature other than room temperature. Epinephrine auto injectors should always be stored at room temperature. Extreme temperatures can damage the medication and make the le- medication less effective. So you always want to keep it at room temperature. You don't want to free- refrigerate it. You don't want to freeze it. You don't want it to stay in your car for a couple reasons. One, extreme temperatures, right? Especially right. down there in Louisiana, Miss Pam. But two, I know, I'm sorry. But hey, up here in Ohio, it's 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 quite <laughs> warm here too. So what am I even saying? Um, but number two, if your epinephrine auto injector is in your car, that means it's not with you. Right. Or it's not with your child. Right. And if you don't have your device, then how are you going to use it when you need it? Exactly. And here's a kind of follow up to that. Um you know, let's talk about summer, summer vacation. You know, we're going to the beach soon. So extreme temperatures, right? Um, how do you protect your epinephrine 
in situations like that, you know, we go to Disney a lot. How do we make sure that it stays protected? What we do, and, and this may not be right, but it makes me feel a little better, is that I actually keep mine in an insulated little case. So, it, you know, I don't put ice on it. It's just an insulated pouch. Um, is that the best way to do it? Because, I mean, you know, right now in Louisiana, it's like 90 degrees. <laughs> so just walking outside, you know, is not room temperature for the device. Behind- Putting it in an insulated pouch like that, that is a great idea. Okay. Um, yeah, you don't want to put it on ice or anything like that. Typically, just keeping it in an insulated um, in an insulated pouch will keep it around that room temperature, so that you're not getting that that flux and extreme, whether it be really really hot or really really cold. Right, and then also leaving it in the car. You know, if you're running inside real quick, you know, it, it's not that immediate, right? It's it's a you're leaving it in your car for a couple of hours situation, correct? That's right. Because your your car is not like suddenly getting to be 120 degrees, but it's when you run in really quick that you don't have it and God forbid you need it right then. Right, right. That's true. So I yeah. always say like Epi has no business being in the glove compartment. Oh, no. Oh, no, that just makes my skin skin crawl when I hear that. And, you know, what we do just for anybody listening who's wondering, well, how does my child or how do I keep it on me? You know, as a mom, it's easy because I just stick it in my purse. And then my daughter has one. Um, You know, she carries like a little mini backpack or and now that she's kind of a tween, she'll be carrying a purse to school. Um, But, you know, just have it on you like you have your phone, right? Like you don't leave your phone in the car. Um, so have it on you. And and actually what we do too is at our door, when we walk in and when we walk out, there's a sign that we have that reminds us, do you have your EpiPen? And, and that's a really good way to remind yourself. I mean, we've been doing this for almost 10 years. So, you know, to us, it's just second nature. But, you know, my daughter now is having to carry it herself. And and I need her to carry it herself. You know, I always have it, but at some point she's going to go out and I don't need her leaving it in the car or at home because it's just not going to work, like you said. So, right. you know, right. just tip for parents, maybe put a sign next to your door or on your um, dash mirror, you know, somewhere where you can remember to take that out. Right. And, and kids mimic parental behaviors. Right. Absolutely. And they pick up they pick up on habits really quickly too. You know, one of our goals this summer was to, and I'm going off subject, but one of our goals this summer was to make sure that my daughter took it everywhere. And, you know, and when she didn't, um, maybe as harsh as it sounds, you know, she, she got in trouble, you know, she didn't get grounded, but we made sure that she understood that if I didn't have mine for her, that means that she, we wouldn't have anything at all if she left it. And I have to tell right. you, she we don't even have to remind her anymore. She goes to where her, she keeps her little purse and she grabs it and she goes. And half the time this summer, I haven't even taken my purse anywhere because, one, we don't go anywhere. But um, two, she's become so good at just remembering because kids do pick up habits. And tip number two. Again, off subject, but if there's anything I could do differently in regards to carrying the EpiPen is that I probably would have had her start doing it herself sooner, you know, with me always as sort of the backup. But I think the younger they are, it just becomes more second nature, right? Um, So when did you start having her carry it? And when would you, like you're saying that you wish you had kind of done it sooner? Well, to be truthful, this is the first time she is 10, fixing to turn 11. This is the first time that she has absolutely been 100% responsible for her epinephrine. Again, I have one, but um, I think it was too late. I think it made it hard for her to remember. Um, so, but, you know, in the past summers, you know, if she went to summer camp or anything like that, she always had it with her. Um But I made sure that it got to where it needed to get. If I could do it all over again, I don't know. I I think that in between school, 
I think I would even say kindergarten, you know, I, I know that that seems a little young, but you can buy those cute little, you know, belts. I just got one, you know, for her for um, if she decides to do sports or anything, you know, so she doesn't have to have her um, purse on her. She can just kind of put this little, um, it's kind of like a little skinny fanny pack and it goes right underneath, you know, her clothes and no one can see it, but maybe put it there and just remind your child to make it a fun thing, you know, hey, you know, you got to put your little belt on and, and maybe that summer, you know, in between kindergarten mm-hmm. and first grade and then doing it again in between first and second grade. And then at some point, just make it a habit on the weekends to, and even if you're a little scared to kind of give that responsibility to a small child like that, maybe just give them a little purse or, you know, if you have a boy, that little belt and, and maybe not have the actual device in it, but that way they they get into that habit of grabbing their belt, grabbing their purse, grabbing their backpack every time they have to walk out the door and you don't have to really stress about it. I, again, she did great. Um, But at the beginning of the summer, I was a little stressed about it because I wasn't sure she would remember. And so I think, again, if I could go back, that's something that I would practice a lot more of. Um, So I'm full of tips today, I think. I love it. And (laughs) and that also highlights why it's so important to talk with your allergist, because I bet a lot of people are thinking, oh, well, my school won't won't let a first grader carry self-carry their epinephrine. This is why it's so important to talk to your allergist and have good open conversations with your allergist and also your school nurse so that you and your allergist can make the best personalized medical recommendations or medical plans together because no, not all first graders are going to be ready to carry a device like that. But some first graders would be. And so yeah. that should be a decision that's personalized between you and your doctor and the kiddo, of course. Right. Um, and and then have discussions with the school. Absolutely. So we're down to number one, Dr. Hoyt. And this is, I think, a really amazing question that gets asked all the time. Um, I had this question as well. Um is it dangerous if you don't need it? Is epinephrine dangerous to the person you're giving it to? Um, if in fact they weren't having an allergic reaction, but maybe they were having a panic attack and you thought, oh my goodness, they're having an allergic reaction. Do I need to give them epinephrine? We had that experience um, at our house. We thought our daughter was having an allergic reaction to something she had eaten because it happened immediately following. Um, it turned out It was not. And it turned out that she was just having an anxiety um, ridden panic attack. Um, And we gave her epinephrine and she was fine. Um, You just answered my question. I'm sorry. (laughs) Don't apologize. Don't apologize because you did exactly the right thing because um, I get this question a lot and um I am blessed to be married to a wonderful man um, who yeah. is also a pediatric cardiologist, specifically an electrophysiologist. So he deals with heart rhythms in children literally all day, every day. And, you know, he will say something along the lines of, well, I would rather regarding the question of, well, well what, if, what if it increases the heart rate too much? He would rather deal with an increased heart rate than no heart right. rate. Right. And that's Absolutely. really what you're dealing with when you're thinking, does this kid need epinephrine? Chances are, if it's crossing your mind, the answer is yes. Right. Um, Giving epinephrine will cause an increase in heart rate. That's one of the things that epinephrine does. When somebody's having an allergic reaction, their own body is producing epinephrine. One of the reasons it's producing it is to help increase the heart rate so that it can pump blood to the brain, to the heart, to the lungs so that you will stay alive during that reaction. Right. One of my pet peeves is when (laughs) my patients, my sweet patients come in and they say, Dr. Hoyt, we used Epi and we went to the ER like you said, but then the ER doctor said that I didn't really need to use the Epi. And I said, I'm so sorry you had this whole experience because nobody wants to see their child go through that. And then nobody wants to be told, oh, you didn't actually need to use that medication. Because actually, if epinephrine is is working at its finest, then by the time you get to the ER, you're not going to have 
as many symptoms. Hopefully right. your symptoms have are no longer progressing. They're stopping and they're, and they're resolving. And that is, that is evidence that the epinephrine is working. And so it's so, it's so frustrating when, when our school nurses get that type of feedback, like, oh, they didn't really need epi. They were fine. Um, right. They were probably fine because that school nurse saved that child's life. Exactly. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, the device itself can seem a little scary, you know, if you don't know what you're doing. Um, oh, yeah. And, I mean, it's a shot. Who wants a shot? Right, right. And, and you're I already wonder, dealing with a life-threatening situation. Now you've got to give them a shot. Like, it's, it's, it's not fun. It is not good. It is not right. happy. Right. And, you know, kind of with that, is it dangerous? You know, one of the questions that I got early on in this journey was, um, oh, well, I hate to give her a shot if she doesn't need it. You know, and so it wasn't just about will the medication hurt her if she doesn't need it. It was that they didn't want to hurt her with the actual shot. And my response was always like, oh, no, you shoot her, (laughs) you know, Um, because I would rather, like we did in our situation, I would rather give Epi in that moment and just kind of have mom guilt for a minute for, you know, making her, um, you know, hurt with the shot or, um, you know, maybe giving her epinephrine when maybe she didn't really need it than to have to um, worry about what would have happened if it was a true reaction and I had not given epinephrine because I was scared that her heart rate would increase too much or, you know, I would hurt her thigh if I gave her a shot she didn't need. Um, no, no. Anaphylaxis right. is dangerous. Not epinephrine. Yeah. Yes. Epinephrine actually stops those allergy cells from secreting all those chemicals that are causing you to have the high of swelling, trouble breathing, vomiting, drop in blood pressure, and ultimately potentially death. So that's why, like we talked about earlier, we don't want to just give any antihistamines and watch and wait because right. yes, histamine is a chemical very much involved with anaphylaxis, but it's not the only chemical. And you really want to stop those allergy cells. And that's what epinephrine does. And the evidence tells us that And the law tells us, too, that's why all these epinephrine laws have been written to reinforce that it is better to err on the side of caution with anaphylaxis. And that side of caution is erring on the side of giving epinephrine from an auto injector and then calling 911, ideally doing it at the same time. Right. You're calling 911 again because you're having a severe allergic reaction, not because the epinephrine is dangerous. Again, can you have adverse effects from epinephrine? Yes. Is the most common one an increase in heart rate? Yes. But it is much better to have an increased heart rate in a child who is now getting better from having an episode of anaphylaxis, their their anaphylaxis is resolving, than it is to delay administration of epinephrine because we know that delayed administration of epinephrine is associated with worse outcomes regarding anaphylaxis. Right. And I think that as a, an allergy parent and, you know, as a school nurse or a person who loves someone with an allergy, um, I think there's too many stories that we have read, um, about people who did not administer epinephrine immediately. And if you ask any of those parents, their one regret is that they didn't do it. So, Mm -hmm. Just do it. When in doubt, do it. If your child is telling you, I can't breathe and, you know, um, you're not quite sure, did they eat something or or something else happening, just stab them <laughs> with that epi um, because you don't you don't want to be that statistic is, is what's always in the back of my mind and, and always what I tell my daughter, always what I tell our family members, teachers, anybody that she is with, please, for the love of, of all that is good in the world, just use it and ask questions later. And I promise mm-hmm. I will not be mad. And I promise I, you know, I will go out and buy another one and I won't, you know, <laughs> whatever your concern is, um, you know, and in the school system, you know, they have rules that they have to follow. And and I always tell them, hey, look, 
I know that you have rules, but as a human, please take care of my daughter and I'll take care of you. You know, um, that's all you have to do. Um, Mm -hmm. so use it. Don't be scared of it. Um, it is scary when someone hands you life saving medication, it's scary, but what makes it less scary is knowing that it works when you Mm -hmm. have to use it. So use it people. (laughs) Wow. So I, I think those were the, the big nine, huh? Yeah. We got through all nine of them. I think we covered a lot. We did. And, you know, there's so many more questions out there, guys. So if you have questions about epinephrine or um, anything that we talked about, tips or just anything, definitely shoot Dr. Hoyt an email at her info blog, um, because the only way that we can sort of get through all of these myths about food allergies and, and get through all the facts that we need as food allergy parents and caregivers is just to ask. Because sometimes, you know, I'm very blessed that my best friend is a food allergist. Um, that just kind of happened. <laughs> um, it was not planned. Um, she became a food allergist before I had a food allergy in our family. Um And, you know, I'm sometimes able to just ask questions um, and learn a little bit more. But um, it's so important to have these conversations with your doctor. Um, And I know going to a doctor's office is sometimes a little scary. You know, you have your list of questions and you get there and you kind of just have like, a brain fog because, you know, you're getting so much information. And and I think that's why this podcast and the info blog is so important, you guys. Um, You know, Dr. Hoyt is here to ask, you know, or to answer as many of the questions that we have that maybe you forgot to ask your own allergist. And yes, she's not your allergist. So, you know, always ask your allergist. But um, bring in those questions and share this with your friends and family um, so that, we can just kind of demystify, like you say, um, everything that there is to know about allergies and, and, and make allergies as weird as it sounds more normal, right? Like there's so many people in the world that have allergies. Let's normalize allergies and and let's not make it this taboo thing that only certain people get. And we don't know why. And epinephrine is scary. Let's, let's make it, you know, normal and ask away and we'll answer. I mean, I may not answer, but Dr. Hoyt will. You're so wonderful, Pam. I'm oh, so glad funny. that that you're a bigger part of the podcast now because um, you have so much insight. You've been doing this for so long. Um, so I'm so glad you're on this team. And uh, let's do this again soon. Yeah, let's do it again. Thanks for listening to this episode of Food Allergy and Your Kiddo with food allergist Dr. Alice Hoyt. For more information on navigating the world of food allergy, visit www.foodallergyandyourkiddo.com and follow Dr. Hoyt on Twitter at Dr. Alice Hoyt. Remember to subscribe, rate, and review. Let's take the anxiety and confusion out of food allergy.